I don't know if you know this, but this Friday is a really, really special day. I mean, really big. It's real big. Um, globally important day this Friday is. Uh, I, I would say, without irony, one of the most important days in the history of the world this Friday is. Something the world has been waiting on for over 40 years. Do you know what it is? This Friday, episode 9 of the Skywalker Saga of Star Wars premieres and theaters around the globe. I'm glad there are other fans in the room. Star Wars. I'm so excited. Um, how can you not be excited? I don't, I don't exactly remember... When I saw Star Wars first, you guys, my parents might know. Sorry, I said you guys like you know who I'm talking to. My parents might know, I don't know. Uh, but I remember the sitting in our living room, watching Luke and Vader fight it out, all that stuff. Hearing that new ones are going to get made, that Lucas is going to come back and make prequels, and a lot of people didn't like those. I loved them because they're my movies. I was the young kid then. They were made for me. And then years later, Disney, all these rumors, Disney's going to buy Star Wars, make new movies. And here we are at the end of a nine film saga told over 40 years with all the same characters. One story. It's exciting. I am pumped. I can't wait. I bought my ticket already. I know what seat I'm sitting in. H7. I know what theater I'm going to be in. Theater 2. It's going to be great. 11 o'clock, Friday morning, can't wait. There's this longing in me, this desire, this anticipation that I've been having, it seems, all my life to see the end of these stories. There's maybe something that you feel that way about, I don't know. Well, I kind of do know, because there probably is, because we're at Christmas time, and all of us were kids once, and you remember waking up every morning one day closer to Christmas. One day closer to Christmas. There's that one thing you want. There's that one event you get to go to. One day closer. One day closer. There's this thing built inside of us, this anticipation, this almost painful longing to make it to what we want. This feeling is not new. Uh, in fact, it's been around for a long time. In fact, it's been a part of the Christian tradition since the beginning, really, that's kind of what Advent is all about. The season, we call it Advent. Advent just means arrival, just Jesus is coming. So we call it Advent. God's people have always been waiting either for his arrival or for his return. And so today, it's what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at a passage talking about Christ's arrival the first time. Let's we'll see what it has to say to us. So if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, you can turn in it, you turn it on, swipe to it, however you get to the Bible, to Isaiah 9. So we're going to spend our time this morning. I'm going to fill you in. I'm going to do something starting in January. I invite you to join me if this sounds interesting to you. I'm going to spend a year. I've got one book of the Old Testament. I've got one book of the New Testament, Isaiah and Romans. And I'm going to spend the entire year just studying those two books. Twelve months reading them over and over and over again, getting everything I can out of them. Because uh, I just bet that if I take intentional time to do that, I'll be more, I'll be closer to God's feelings and God's thoughts than I was at the beginning of the year if I really intentionally do that. So I would invite you, I challenge you, in fact, if you're the kind of person who wants to grow deeper, do that. Pick a book of the Old Testament. Pick a, pick a book of the New Testament. Let's just study it all year. See what we get in December. And then soapbox and announcement time. If you are the kind of person that says, I would love to do that, but I don't have a clue how to study the Bible that way, awesome. January 8th, Wednesday night, we're going to start a class over in the high school going through Howard Hendricks' Living by the Book. I'm going to teach it. Just the inductive Bible study method. Just a way to study the scripture without having someone teach it to you. It's great. So if you're interested in learning about that, come join us January 8th. 
Wednesday night. We'll see what happens. Off soapbox. Here we go. Isaiah, it's a book of prophecy. Um, prophecy can be tricky, right? Because when we hear prophecy, we think something that's going to happen in the future, something that hasn't happened yet. And while that's true, there are things in Isaiah about what's going to happen in the future. We need to remember Isaiah was a person talking to people in a place at a time. It doesn't just exist only for our benefit. There was a people that heard this and it meant something to them. So we need to look at how we got to Isaiah 9 so that we can understand Isaiah 9. So if you remember, King David established as king of Israel by God, has a son named Solomon who is king. Solomon eventually dies 200 years later, Isaiah 9. In that 200 years, crazy things have happened. The 12 tribes of Israel have split. 10 northern tribes are rebelling against God's throne, against David's lineage. They don't want to follow the way that they're supposed to. So they form the nation of Israel, these 10 northern tribes. Southern nations are following after God's way, form the nation of Judah. And Israel, to protect themselves from foreign armies, forms a pact with Syria. To protect themselves specifically against the Assyrians. It's political intrigue gone mad. They want Judah to join with them, create this three-headed army that could probably take over the world. But King Ahaz, the king of Judah, says, no, we're going to do things God's way. And so Israel and Syria decide to kill King Ahaz, to take over his throne, install their own shadow government so they can get done what they want to get done. It's like if you took the plot of Scandal and you took the plot of House of Cards and you took the plot of, pick another one, designated survivor, and you put them all together, and you get this mass political intrigue happening right here at the beginning of the book of Isaiah. There's a problem with this plan, though. God has promised the people of Israel and Judah that King David's throne will not be going anywhere. Nothing's going to happen to it. He won't let it vanish. Their plan is doomed from the start. Isaiah tells us that back in chapter 7. He tells us very importantly, there is no need to panic. God is with his people. If you're the kind of person that likes to take notes, I invite you. That's a good thing to write down. There is no need to panic. God is with his people. That's good for us just to know the daily doldrum of life. There is no need to panic. God is with his people. But also, when we're reading prophecy, it's a good thing to remember. There's no need to panic. God is with his people. When we read about doom and gloom and judgment and fire and all these awful things, there's no need to panic. God is with his people. And when we don't know what's coming next and we don't see how God's promises are going to come true, there's no need to panic. God's with his people. It's going to be fun. The problem is Ahaz doesn't believe that. Uh, or at least Ahaz doesn't want to believe that. Ahaz is much more comfortable devising his own salvation. He's lusting after the success of his own plan rather than delighting in the victory of God. So in chapter 7, Isaiah comes and delivers a sermon to Ahaz. This two-chapter sermon. And the point of the sermon is this. Who are you going to trust, Ahaz? Also us, speaking to us as well. Isaiah tells him, Ahaz, eventually God is going to take everyone through some sort of crisis. And at the end of that time, you are going to ask yourself, was it worth it to trust in God? Or would I have been, would I have been better off trusting in myself? Isaiah's answer is clear. Trusting in God is always the right way, but no one chooses that. Isaiah tells us God's people never trust him as they should, and they pay a price for it. It's the end of chapter 8. There will be distress and darkness. This great phrase, the gloom of anguish. I love that. People will be thrust into thick darkness, and the curtain starts to fall. And we open on chapter 9. Let's dive in. First seven verses of chapter 9. 
And we're just going to take them one at a time and see what they have to say to us. Here we go. Verse 1 of chapter 9. But, and we pause. That's important. Don't overlook small words. I know that's cruel. We read one word and we're, gonna, we're still not there. We haven't started yet. But, but is a really important word. It's three letters. There might not be a bigger word in Scripture. Anytime you see the word but, specifically at the beginning of a phrase, specifically when God is talking, you need to pay very close attention because oftentimes this is where God does miraculous things, as in the word but. And this is a pretty big but, right? Because here, God is telling us in the midst of all this tribulation, all this darkness from chapter 8, the anguish of despair, God's grace will have the last word. Even after all of that, God is not satisfied with where his people are. God's grace will triumph over their failure. God's grace will have the last word. That's the second thing you can write. But here we go. Let's start. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the lands of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them, a light has shone. See, God is coming to his people first where they have suffered the most. And from that place, he's going to launch salvation into the entire world. Whenever foreign powers would attack this nation, they would come from the north because there's mountains and there's an ocean. There's no way to get there except to come from the north. And they would always attack the same place. Zebulun, Naphtali, just these cities in the north, and the Galilee of the nations, just means the part of Galilee where the Gentiles lived. These people knew pain. These people were constantly in slavery. These people were constantly in anguish. Every captor, every foreign army attacking there, coming right through their city. just like the Assyrians do here in Isaiah. But God is going to turn this invasion into mission by making the people of Galilee the first ones to see the light of Jesus. This is how God ushers in a new era of triumphant grace. The same Galilee would be where Jesus does his work. And you'll see this common thread as we go that we don't make any contribution to this. The ones walking in darkness suddenly found themselves blinking under a new light that they had never seen before. They all deserved what happened to them, but God wasn't satisfied. His zeal, as we will see later, brings a savior. Let's keep reading. Verse three, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. What's going on here? God here is at work. It's the third thing you can write. God is at work in verse 3. He is spreading his light to more and more people. He's multiplying the nation. He's taking what was this nation of Israel and making it, as Revelation 7 tells us, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, tribe, people, and language, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is where it's headed here in Isaiah. And this joy of the multiplied people is not a meager, wimpy, happy, clappy kind of joy. This is not small joy like a 100% pay raise or the locker room after you win the Super Bowl. That's small joy compared to this joy. See, the triumph of God's grace over our depressing failure is joy unspeakable, unimaginable, unquantifiable, and incontrovertible. And it is full of glory, not just for a little while, but for forever. God's joy, unlike ours, is eternal. We can bank on it. It's never going to end. 
forever and ever. And how is this going to happen? Well, now we get these three four statements, F-O-R statements. How? Four. Verse four. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. What's he getting at? Well, he's talking about envisioning this salvation as a freedom fighter, a great warrior like Gideon. You remember Gideon from the Old Testament? Destroys the Midianite hordes. What do we learn from Gideon? Well, we learn that God does the work. It's this stellar through line here. You and I are not the subject of any of the verbs in verses 4, 5, and 6. Why? Because true liberation comes from beyond ourselves. That's why Gideon's mentioned here. Gideon broke through the Midianite hordes. This was an unlikely hero. God reduces the size of Gideon's army from 32,000 to 300, has this audacious plan to have them blow trumpets and break vases and light torches. It shouldn't work. But it does. And the Midianites, they slaughter themselves. They go into a panic. God is at work through his servant, Gideon, achieving liberation for his people that they could have never attained on their own. That's why Gideon's here. But Isaiah is actually looking forward to a liberator who's even greater than Gideon. Next one. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This liberator that God is sending, he's, he's not coming just to defeat our enemies. Armies can defeat enemies. Armies can set captors free. That's easy. God has come to do the hard thing. He is getting rid of the concept of strife itself. Every mechanism of tyranny, everyone will go into the bonfire of God's grace. Every fight, every struggle, every pain, And not just those specific things, but the idea of pain, the idea of strife, the idea of struggle, the idea of oppression. It all gets used as fuel for the fire of God's grace that purifies everything. And again, don't miss it. This passive voice, it will be burned. This is not a victory that we win. This is a victory that God has already won. In fact, we're not even there. We step onto the battlefield well after the war is over. We celebrate God's victory. Not that anyone should boast. Only through his power. And here you can almost hear the Israelites asking, who then, Isaiah, who will be this powerful figure striding across the world stage? We've been hearing about him since the beginning of time. Through what magnificent person does the zeal of the Lord renew the world forever. He tells us in verse 6, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us is a child. God's power is so far superior to the Assyrians and all the other big shots of the world and bullies of all time. He's so much more powerful that he can defeat them by coming as a baby. God's answer to all the bullies swaggering throughout history is not more swagger is not to become a bigger bully. God doesn't need swagger. God's answer to our pain is Jesus. And Jesus alone. And, and when we finally get close enough to the secret of world peace to actually see it clearly, you know what we find? Against all of our assumptions and all of our expectations, we find weakness overwhelming power and foolishness outfoxing Wisdom. The Apostle Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians 1. He says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. And the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. What's Paul saying? Every human attempt fails. There is no one strong enough to do what this Savior can do. No human. There's no human wise enough to save us and redeem us. It can't happen. However improbable, the gospel must be true. God does not need our strength or our brains. Jesus Christ crucified is the only Savior and King of the world. And don't miss this. Verse 6 is a super important verse. It's it's one of the ones we know best from Christmas time, obviously. And it's the center point of this prophecy. It's where all of this is going. If you're a good student of your Bible, you would notice something else here. See, way back in Genesis 3, this idea of a redeemer who will come to set us free begins. Where God tells Eve that out of her offspring, one will come who will crush the serpent's head with his heel. And then later on, he's raising up a prophet even greater than Moses and a warrior even greater than Gideon. But here, for the first time in the whole Bible, God is finally telling his people who is coming. And it's not just some person that he is indwelling with power. It's not just some man that he has found. It is him himself coming to rescue his people. No one has the name Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, except for Christ himself, God himself. Every other time, God is raising up a prophet or a warrior, but here, it is God in the flesh. Finally, a redeemer we can actually trust Not someone who can fail and will fail and changes their minds like we do, but one who cannot change and cannot fail. So in our fear and in our failure and in our sin, this disease that each one of us have from birth that has killed us and will continue to kill us over and over, what are we to do? The answer is clear. We look to Jesus. We look to Jesus as wonderful counselor. He has the best ideas and the best strategies, so let's follow him. We look to Jesus as the mighty God. He defeats his enemies easily, so let's hide behind him. As everlasting father, he loves us endlessly, so let's enjoy him. And as the prince of peace, he reconciles us while we were still his enemies, so let's welcome his dominion. So this is the great thing about this Jesse tree is because every night you've been following along, what you've been doing is tracing who Christ is through all of these stories. And here in Isaiah, he's finally telling us, by the way, this man is not only a man. This man is Jesus. So maybe tonight when you read Isaiah 9 together with your families and all the rest of the nights, make sure we focus on what it's telling us. Yes, Christ is the reason for the season. We say that often, but do we actually believe it? Is Jesus actually the center of everything we do at Christmas time? Or is he a helpful addition? Or is he the center of the universe? Isaiah is going to tell us exactly what he is. Verse 7 Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And who's going to do it? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This child is the king of all kings, saving us from our miserable 
failure, lifting us into his own justice and righteousness. He is Jesus Christ, the Lord, our crucified, risen, reigning, and coming again Savior. And get this, he will not come back to just tweak this problem and make this thing better, but he will return with a massive correction of all systematic evil forever. It's not easy what he's doing. He's doing something bigger than we could ever imagine. That's the best part. I've read this verse wrong my entire life until just this past couple of weeks getting ready for this. I always thought it was his government and his peace that never ends. That's not what it says. It's the increase of his government and peace that never ends. It's small. It's a subtle difference. But it's really important. This empire of grace will not only just not end, but it will forever expand. If we will live by faith, trust him now, accepting his weakness as our strength, his folly as our wisdom, we will be there to enjoy his triumph forever, ascending, enlarging, accelerating, and intensifying. And there will never come a day where we are not surprised and shocked by the merits of God's grace. He will always find ways to surprise us with the goodness of his mercy. There will never come a day where we find the end of that. The finite will experience ever more wonderfully the infinite. And every new moment will be better than the last. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is great news. Because for so many of us, This season, especially, but a lot of seasons, all seasons can be difficult because we don't see the end in sight. Whatever pain, whatever strife that we see happening, we don't see the end. Advent is very difficult, all the waiting all the anticipation, like a child on Christmas Eve, hoping that the next time I wake up, that present will be there. Hoping that the next time I wake up, my life isn't in shambles. We have kin with these people in Isaiah. Because they were the same. Their life was a mess. Completely enslaved, attacked all the time. And remember, these are real people who heard this prophecy somewhere around 730 years before Jesus was even born. That means no one who heard this in person made it to see Jesus' birth. They just sat in pain and waited. And now we wait. We're 2,000 years waiting for Christ's return to finally set the score His way. This promise fulfillment when he finally overthrows evil forever. And so we have to live in this reality is the last thing you can write down. Reality that hope has come and hope will come again. And in the midst of the struggle of life this painful reoccurrence that we call day. Hope came once and hope is coming back. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. He is in the business of making all things new, taking what was dead, us, and bringing it to life. And here's the amazing thing. You look back at verse six, and we don't want to miss small words. For unto us a child is born. Here, prophetic for us, reminiscent of another famous Christmas passage when the shepherds were told by the angels, Fear not, for unto you in the city of David is born a child who is Christ the Lord. That word's important because it's not unto some other people Jesus is born. Now Christ came for you to redeem you 
not some better version of you, not some future version of you that's got it figured out, not some future version of you who has finally started to live correctly. No, Christ has come for you. Jesus has come for the exact people just like us. He wasn't expecting something better and he doesn't have any buyer's remorse. Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into when he got on the cross and he's not asking for a return. That can land on us like a rock because we think that we're not good enough. But at Christmas, we get to evaluate why Christ came to set us free, to raise us to life, not just to make us better and not in hopes that we would be better. It's entirely possible this morning that you are the kind of person that has never trusted in Christ. And graciously, maybe this morning and for some time now, the Holy Spirit has been convicting you, pulling on you. I beg you not to run away from that. Trust in Christ. Hope has come. And hope will come again. You surrender him, surrender to him today with the empty hands of faith. He will be faithful to forgive you and to redeem you. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Or maybe you do know Christ. You are trusting in him, but you're acting more like the king, Ahaz. You're planning your own salvation. You're expecting that with my work plus Jesus' work, everything's going to turn out okay. I would challenge you this morning. A light has shone on us. We didn't turn it on. Trust in Christ. Hope has come. Hope is coming again. Not living a life of panic, but trusting in the promise of God. He is with us. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. The gift of your son this Christmas season. That you have set us free. You have done the work for us. This is the truth of amazing grace. That you are a redeemer who longs to raise us from death. If we'll but trust in you. Turn from our sin. God, I pray you will act on those who haven't done that. That you instill in them a new spirit of repentance and faith in you this morning. God, this season can be hard with waiting and struggle and the busyness of life. We tend to forget to trust you and not our time management and not our family and not our history. No, we trust in you. And you have promised a glorious future for those who do that. So would you help us stay faithful, be strong, and to trust in you so that through our witness, we can go and show the world how to be a disciple, makes disciples. Once you do that, once you come, in Jesus' name. Amen.